So good morning uh, and welcome on behalf of Kohler. Uh, we're very pleased to be hosting this outstanding event. I had no idea that this was a 10th anniversary event, so congratulations. Uh, I know we've been members for a little while, but uh, certainly not that long, but we're, we're, we're very enthusiastic about what we're seeing. I took a look at the agenda, uh, just want to express my thanks to all of the fo folks that participated in putting the program together, the, the coordinators and the participants and the moderators. I, I think you have ahead of you a very high quality day. So, um, but about Kohler a little bit. We have a pretty long history of environmental stewardship. Um, and stewardship is sort of our name for what most companies call CSR. And it has really four components, arts, community, workspace, and environment. And in that fourth uh, category, environment, is where sustainability resides. Some 10 years back, we formalized our sustainability uh, efforts and really we started with footprint. Uh, this is sort of the, the place where most people start. You know, how do we make our operations less environmentally intense? Uh, whether it's carbon, whether it's water, whether it's solid waste, toxics, you know, and so we institute a lot of things in, in that category. But then we realized product innovation also is a pretty key category. Uh, because when you look at the life cycle footprint of most consumer goods companies, certainly ours, the footprint of the life cycle in its use phase and uh, in some cases in the supply chain phase far outstrips what's actually being done in the footprint phase within the four, four walls. So tremendous opportunities there. How do we make our products better with every successive generation more environmentally efficient? Uh, and then the third thing that, that really comprises the other two boxes that you see on the screen is culture. Uh, and culture has got two pieces. How do we talk about this and how do we think about this within the company, uh, with our associates? How do we make decisions that adequately use uh, environmental information as an input to some of our business decisions? And then how do we talk and educate all the other stakeholders, whether it's customers or suppliers or others in our world? How do we talk about the brand in a way that's meaningful for this? So, uh, candidly, when I started and took this on, I thought most of my time was going to be in the footprint phase, specifically in the four walls. And don't get me wrong, we have done a lot of work in that category. But more and more, product and culture are the things that are really going to define the long-term uh, view and how we're going to be working with this. And if you know anything about Kohler, we value the long term. We certainly want to make good short term decisions, but above all, we want to make sure that in the long term we're, we're, we're doing the right things for the business, for the customers, for all of our stakeholders, and for our associates and the environment. So this is very much a work in progress with quite a few things that have been accomplished uh, so far, but a long way to go. Uh, it's a journey. And to have any chance in this journey, um, you know, of success, you have to have strong organizational commitment and strong alignment with business leadership. And that begins at the very top. Uh, so to tell you our story, we thought who better to articulate this than our president and CEO, David Kohler. David's been with the company for 26 years. Uh, he has been our president and chief executive officer since June of 2015. And, after, uh, and this was after serving as president and uh, chief operating officer since 2009. He's a fourth generation Kohler family uh, member to lead the company since its inception in 1873. He has been the driving force behind both the strategy and our execution of sustainability. And he's here to tell you th that story. David? Thank you, Dauber. And, uh, and thank you, Tom. What Dauber said is not completely true. Uh, Dauber has also been uh, a critical driving force in, uh, in our sustainability journey. Thank you, Tom. And, uh, and the whole team. Uh, we have Nathan Nissen back here. 
uh, who's been a, a critical member of that journey, and Rob Zimmerman is somewhere out here, I'm sure, and, and others uh, who've been, been part of, of our journey as a company on sustainability. Uh, but first and foremost, I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank, uh, I want to thank you all for your commitment to sustainability. Um, we think it's the only path. Teresa is here too, another, another passionate sustainability enthusiast. Color. But we think it's the only path, and we want to build a company uh, that you can trust. Uh, and that's really who we are, I think, as a company. We're a company of character, integrity, at, at, the, at the basic fiber of who we are. And uh, I think, you know, I'll tell you the story of, of how we got to where we are today. As Davor said, uh, you know, it is absolutely a journey. Uh, we don't profess to be at the finish line uh, or anywhere close, but we're on our way. And uh, we're trying to lead by example and show other companies what's possible as well as we're learning uh, from other companies along the way. So I'll talk a little bit about the company. I'll talk about our sustainability journey and then uh, uh, do a Q&A. And anything's fair game you want to talk about our challenges. Um, so our company was founded by my great-grandfather in 1873. He was an immigrant from Austria, came to the United States, he grew up on a farm in Minnesota went to college in Chicago, and he was a, a traveling salesman selling furniture up into this area of Wisconsin. There wasn't much here at the time. He fell in love with a young lady, and her father owned a cast iron foundry in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And he was able to acquire into the cast iron foundry and eventually own the cast iron foundry. And that's how we got started, as a cast iron foundry, making farm implements, plows, all sorts of different things, ornamental crosses. And it was a difficult time in the United States at the time, so he had to be very creative and entrepreneurial uh, to find different businesses to grow. Uh, so about 10 years after he uh, acquired the company, uh, he took a horse trough hog scholder, enameled it, furnished it with four feet, and created our first bathtub. And that's really what got us into the, uh, the plumbing business. He sold that bathtub for one cow and 14 chickens. Uh, today, we still wish we could get one cow and 14 chickens for a bathtub. Uh, but it, uh, it was a great start story, and I think it's that entrepreneurial spirit, that kind of relentless spirit, belief in this country, uh, belief in his organization, pioneering spirit to find opportunities to grow that we want to continue to keep alive in our company as we pioneer new markets and we drive sustainability or anything we do. If you look at the company today, we're about six and a half billion dollars in size, about 37,000 associates around the world. Uh, we have a footprint around the world that's fairly balanced. Uh, the Asia Pacific has been the fastest growing region over the past uh, 20 years, uh, but we also have a presence uh, in Europe as well and uh, in the Americas. Uh, we're very honored that Fast Company uh, recognized us a number of years ago for being one of the American companies that really gets design and to be noted up there with some of the, the great other design uh, American brands was, uh, was a great honor for us. But design and, uh, and innovation is something that we're very passionate about as a company. Uh, we were very honored to be recognized also uh, by Fortune magazine for our, our importance in, in the home uh, in the United States and around the world. There's really three main activities in our company, three main groups. The first is kitchen and bath. And uh, the cornerstone of, of that business globally is the number one market position here in the United States. We're now number one in China that's been built over the past 20 years. And we're the number one international brand now in India. And we think it is a, a very important economy for the, the future, and that's why we note it. Uh, many of the, uh, the, the, the brand positioning and, and the, the products that underline that today um, really show our focus on innovation and technology. And there's obviously a, a huge drive for uh, smart products, intelligent products, digital products, but in all of these things, like a digital thermostatic valve uh, or touchless kitchen faucets, or even uh, intelligent, uh, intelligent toilets, all of these things are not really sacrificing uh, sustainability for performance. We're really bringing in water conservation and sustainability practices into these 
uh, into these products, but it can kind of give you uh, an idea of the technology drive in our company to stay on the forefront of products and technology in that business. This is a really interesting product that was developed by uh, uh, our design team. It took five years to develop this product, and it's called Real Rain. Uh, it was designed to, to emulate the randomness and, and the purity of rain. You know, we have so many of these big ceiling mounted rain showers today that consume a lot of water. Uh, this product actually consumes less water than a normal shower head and gives you this, this real authentic rain experience and a deluge experience. So it's a, a pretty interesting uh, product development giving an incredible experience but also uh, driving sustainability as well. Uh, one of the trends happening in this business is omnichannel. Digital is very strong around the world. We're also building our physical presence around the world. This is our uh, recent opening of the Polar Experience Center in New York and then uh, some other locations in Singapore, Taipei, Bangkok, and India, uh, some different markets around the world. Our second group is the engine and generator business, the, the power business. We got into this business in 1920. We had a creative engineer who saw the need for power in, in rural America. And being entrepreneurial, he designed an internal combustion engine using our cast iron capability, and that's how we got into uh, power generation. He took that engine and then uh, put an alternator with it and created our first uh, generator. So we got into this business in the 20s. Uh, it's composed of our engine business. Uh, this business, uh, like all our businesses, is also being driven by uh, sustainability. Uh, certainly it's a contrast for us being in an engine business and also driving sustainability. Uh, we recognize that irony, uh, but you know we have this business and uh, we continue to drive this business with the same principles. Uh, this is our EFI, electronic fuel injection, so we're really driving technology to reduce emissions, to reduce fuel consumption, and really that's the trend driving our business you know, across the board as a company. This is an example of one of our large uh, generator sets. And a recent acquisition we actually made this year into clean energy. As Tom said, this is a bridge strategy uh, to the future, to renewables. This, is, uh, this business completely focuses on natural gas uh, engineering, installation, and servicing of, of power plants uh, around the world. And this is an example of one of their uh, capabilities uh, this company is very advanced and probably the most advanced in the world in, in, in its like kind of dealing with biogas, uh, coal seam gas, all of the uh, gas byproducts that are out there as well as base natural gas. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting technical uh, addition for us as a company. <coughs> and then our third group is the, uh, is the part of the business we're uh, enjoying today and that's the uh, Gulf Resort business. And it's anchored here by uh, Destination Polar, the American Club, uh, which is complemented by the four golf courses here that have hosted six major championships. And then we also have a location uh, now in Green Bay, Ashwaubenon. Uh, this is the newest uh, part of the, the group, which is located right across from Lambeau Field. Have any of you seen this in Green Bay? Do we have any Packer fans here? <laughs> Please, uh, if you don't stay there, please come and uh, enjoy the bar. It's a great location on top, on the top floor overlooking Lambeau called Tavern in the Sky. We'd love to have you. And, uh, and then my father's favorite new product introduction, I think. <laughs> I think he enjoys the tasting sometimes more than anything. Uh, but uh, this is the new Kohler chocolate brandy. Who's tried this? Anybody tried this? You have low market penetration here. <laughs> Since uh, you're visiting Kohler, you might want to take a gift away. All of our shops carry this. So I'm sure you can take a gift away and enjoy the holidays. But all of our businesses are brought together by our mission and our guiding principles. And if you look inside our mission, and this wasn't just created in the last decade, this is well over 30 years old, you can see the enhancement of nature is one of the defining attributes that we talk about when we think about voracious living. So it's really been in our, our mission and ethos as a company for a long time. And if you look at our guiding principles, these are really uh, the principles that form the DNA of our company. And, the first one is one that I've talked about, living on the leading edge of design and technology, and then maintaining a single level of quality, uh, building an organization of a strong, 
uh, passion. And then finally, reinvesting in the business. We're a privately held company, and we reinvest over 90% of our earnings back in the business. And that, that really gives us the fuel for growth and investment. We, we have no debt as a company, and uh, we're continually uh, looking for good investments as a business. If you look at our strategic imperatives that we've set for the company going forward, we have six strategic imperatives that you can see. Uh, they really flow from our guiding principles, but the one on the bottom is one that I wanted to highlight, and that's really living stewardship and, and sustainability. For exactly the reasons Tom said, first of all, it's part of our character, it's what we believe, we're not doing it for marketing, um, but we believe passionately that we want to have a bigger purpose in life and contribution to the world than just being a company, making money and reinvesting. We want to actually you know, give back and, and make a positive impact on the world around us. And so that's, that's why it's there. And I want to just kind of digress a little bit now and, and transition um, from that into the sustainability journey and then we'll, we'll kind of come back and, and bring it back to the business. Um, but the sustainability journey is, uh, is, a, is a great story and it, it, it goes back to the uh, really beginning of the company. I mean, these are pictures of, of, of our environment and I grew up in, uh, in this community and uh, you know, my forefathers and, and all the associates who've moved here or grown up here have grown up in this, this incredible uh, place called Wisconsin. And uh, you know, the, uh, the environment around us is, is absolutely amazing. I travel a lot around the world um, and I spend a lot of time in countries like China and India and all over the world. And the, the place we have here in Wisconsin, the purity of the water, uh, the, the, you know, the, how pristine uh, this environment is, really should teach us all about uh, the beauty, the preciousness, and, and, and why we're really doing this, uh, because of, of, of how important the environment is to our sustenance, as well as our creative energy. We get a lot of uh, creative rejuvenation uh, from the environment. So, you know, this is how I grew up in, in, in this area. Not with the golf courses at the time when I was growing up. Uh, but we also, if you look back in the, in the history of, of the company, you can see some really incredible forward-looking uh, statements by the leaders throughout the, the years. And this was Walter Kohler actually built the American Club for Immigrants. Uh, that's when the United States actually wanted immigrants. And uh, we built this uh, place called the American Club. Uh, so immigrants could, could learn and study English and gain their citizenship while they earned enough money to bring their family over. So an incredibly forward-looking guy. He also served as a Republican uh, governor in the state of Wisconsin. Anyhow, he said this in 1934 about the importance of the environment. He also said this. Um, back then, you know, man has been creating a new world but neglecting to prepare himself to live in it in a rational way. He has great power to control his environment, but he's made something of a mess of it. And that was in 1934. Uh, just an, incredible. So, you know, for us to follow an individual like this, uh, who already put forward, you know, the belief statement as a company and, and set us on the right path, uh, you know, was a you know a great honor and responsibility. And this is my father, and you know, in the '90s, and, and the leaders in between. But he really uh, continued to set the company on the path of being a good uh, environmental uh, steward as a company. So uh, our roots in this area, you know, really go back uh, throughout our history. And I think you know we are by far not a perfect company. Uh, we've made mistakes along the way uh, and will continue to do, but I think inherently we've had a belief uh, in doing the right thing and we're continuing to drive the business uh, in that vein. On our journey, I wanted to share a personal story about this individual. This is a gentleman named Ray Anderson. He's now deceased. He's the founder of Interface. And when we started to study um, sustainability, uh, probably 20 years ago, we started to, to really learn about this company interface, and I knew nothing about it. Uh, but when I got a call about 12 years ago to join the, or 11 years ago, to join the board of interface by Ray Anderson, I, I was, you know, sat up in my chair and I said, this is the guy 
who's out there being the pioneer in terms of sustainability and bringing capitalism and sustainability together and showing the world how they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, but he was an incredible, incredible individual. And I think Interface today is one of the most sustainable companies in the world. Anyhow, I joined the board of Interface about a decade ago, and I've been part of, of their journey to continue and, and post Ray to continue his legacy going forward. Uh, but he was really a, you know, a very deep thinker and uh, out there on the forefront. So certainly, uh, our strategy today is partly shaped by our history, it's partly shaped by our, our team here at Kohler, and it's also shaped by, by Ray's belief, uh, beliefs as well. So uh, over, uh, you know, over 10 years ago, we started looking around and we had been a good environmental citizen, but we really said, you know, we have to do more. As we started to look out uh, at the world around us, what would it look like in, in 2035? Um, we started to look at resource scarcity that were close to us because we deal with water. Uh, and we deal with uh, markets around the world and, and right here in the United States we started seeing water shortages and, and issues. Uh, we started looking at the real facts around climate change and, and global warming uh, which are continuing to get very alarming. Um, and uh, we said, you know, as a, as a business, you know, we have to do more. Um, so we created uh, what was called KELP, the Kohler Environmental Leadership Team. We have a number of our members of KELP here today. Um, and Don, we're headed it up. And the, the charge for KELP was, let's put together a more aggressive sustainability strategy. Because these trends are real. Um, how people can sit there and refute the scientific fact around um, you know, carbon and climate change is, uh, is absolutely uh, incredible to me uh, and somewhat criminal because, uh, you know, this is happening. Um, so we as a company uh, really looked at it and said, you know, let's create a strategy uh, around sustainability that's not just about doing less bad. Nobody wants to get up in the morning and say, you know, today I'm going to do less bad. Okay. Well, let's all try to do less bad, but let's also try to do something more and, uh, and create a strategy that is actually offensive as well as just defensive and doing less bad. And how can we create a sustainability strategy that's about differentiation, it's about growth, it's about trust, it's about doing the right things, admitting your faults, uh, but trying to be better. And, uh, and that was really, you know, the premise of our sustainability strategies. How do we create something that's not about massive trade-offs and compromise? How do we make decisions that are actually good for business, but also good for the environment, and create this, uh, this, this, this uh, virtuous kind of cycle, if you will, uh, for the business going forward? And, um, and I think we, we really did that. So, there were originally just really kind of three uh, primary elements to our strategy. And, and the first one was footprint reduction. And we're on that course of so reducing our environmental footprint 3% per annum um, in the major areas. And then second, product innovation. How do we drive offensively more environmentally friendly products? And if you look at our business today, the fastest growing product lines in our whole company are more environmentally friendly products. They could Conserve water, lower emissions, lower fuel consumption, but they're all in the end products. And then finally, how do we lead by example? We spent a lot of time not really telling anybody about what we were doing because we were very concerned. We don't want to go out there and be one of these greenwashing companies who fills out the annual report and it's all about that. You know, but let's let's actually create some result, create a strategy, and then we'll start to share it over time because what we're doing is more important than marketing it. And honestly, that's really what we're about. Now we start to think, well, being a trusted, sustainable brand can help our business and that's good, but the first, the first priority is just doing the right thing. And that's, that's what we're focused on. And really build, building, as Dower said, a, a culture uh, that's energized um, and really understands sustainability and, uh, and what we can do going forward. And also trying to communicate that and, and teach our customers 
uh, and trade customers around the world of how they can be more sustainable. So if you look at our results then over the intervening period since 2008, we've reduced our environmental footprint 25%. Uh, we now ship over $1.4 billion a year of more environmentally friendly products. Uh, and then we're doing a lot on the education side, and we'll talk about some of those things internally uh, as well as externally. It's little things, it's big, big things, uh, small projects uh, in manufacturing as well as larger uh, technology projects. It's, uh, this is a, a new solar array, so really understanding our energy team, really understanding incentives available all over the world for renewables and driving those investments in the markets where they make economic sense. Doing a lot of uh, education, it's like Kaizen or Lean. If we can teach the organization to have eyes for sustainability, uh, we believe you know, we create more energy and champions throughout the organization to drive it. Uh, as a full organization. Uh, really challenging all of our businesses. This is a, a more sustainable bunker. Uh, we had issues with water drainage in bunkers, so we actually used basically uh, scrap uh, ceramics to form a, a bedding of a bunker here uh, in, this, in this project to create a more sustainable bunker at Whistling Straits. Uh, using food scraps uh, to create uh, biogas with our scraps at the shops at Wood Lake. Um, and then, you know, Teresa and her husband Jim are really leading this initiative. And we were just out there last night in the factory uh, and we're building a waste lab. You know, Teresa has been passionate about, we have all this waste, too much waste and scrap that we're still having to ship to the landfill. We're trying to reduce that, but in the interim, you know, how do we create product out of it? So she and uh, Jim have created, with the team, have created the Waste Lab. And we're taking this, uh, you, know, you know, dust, foundry dust, and pottery coal and scrap, and finding all the various combinations that we can uh, use to create some pretty amazing uh, tile. And here's an example of, if you take some of that waste and mix it with concrete, you can create pavers. And tiles, we think we can even get into lavatories and other, other dimensional products uh, using this waste. And it's really, again, trying to show you know, the world and ourselves what's possible using a creative uh, process to turn waste into something of value. And uh, it's a great, exciting endeavor for us. And uh, I think it'll, it'll send us on a lot of interesting paths going forward. We, uh, we focus on building uh, buildings uh, in a more sustainable way. So this was uh, uh, one of our recent lead gold buildings, uh, the Beacon uh, here. We also focus a lot on recycling old buildings. We're, we're most interested in how we can really reuse many of our old buildings and not move into new buildings. Uh, this was taking lead into one of our retail showrooms uh, that was actually done in Wisconsin. One of the first of its kind, a, a retail store. Uh, but overall, then, really driving uh, from a product development standpoint, trying to embrace the, the full life cycle in product development. This is probably uh, one of our bigger cultural challenges going forward, is to fully institutionalize and embed our sustainable practices into our product development. Uh, planning as well as process uh, from cradle to grave. Uh, but this work and this education is, uh, is going on. We've started LCAs on a number of our product categories and we'll continue that going forward uh, because it's being asked for as, as well as we believe uh, it's the right thing to do. Um, and then working on the culture shift in the organization uh, how do we really build more understanding and, and technical learning around design for environment? Some of the examples, you know, there's a lot of wins, I think, in each of the businesses uh, from simple, simple packaging and, and, and uh, better ways to drive freight maximization and lower, lower fuel costs all the way up to driving into to, to new technical product design. There's a, a biogas product on the, on the top right. Um, in a you know, variety of different products. We also uh, participate in Greenbuild. I don't know if, how many of you have heard of Greenbuild. It's uh, in our industry building products. It is the sustainability show by the USGBC. 
Uh, we've been uh, an, an anchor sponsor and supporter of, of Greenville really since it started. Um, and this year we had our team there talking on a, a variety of different forums about sustainability to the, the attendees that were there. But again, trying to use our, our position to help educate and, uh, the, or the, the industry really on, on sustainable practices. We're very honored to be recognized by the EPA 10 times more than any other company on the planet for our work in water conservation. Uh, so we're very proud of that. And one of the things, this is a, a consumer advocacy uh, program we launched a number of years ago called Commit to Six. How can we educate uh, the public on using actually shorter showers? Some might think we want to encourage people to take longer showers, but how can we also uh, talk about the ability of people to enjoy their shower but also save water? Um, and then a number of social media things around Earth Day and uh, how can we um, you know, really use our position again to communicate broader causes and what uh, action can be against those. And various internal associate events. Uh, this was... Uh, a recent challenge we did around sustainability uh, that drove uh, making sustainable choices, you know, taking a quiz and, and understanding what are sustainable choices and right sustainable choices. Um, and then Dabur really uh, also created this award and Dabur and his team, uh, the Kel team, created this uh, sustainability award that all of our manufacturing facilities compete for every year. It's actually made out of recycled uh, materials. Uh, but they compete for, and all of our plants compete to be you know, the most improved and most sustainable plant that we have each year, so it's a good competition. Um, and then in 2016, we completed and then launched publicly our first uh, sustainability and stewardship report uh, that you know, we're sharing with the world. And for a private company, it doesn't have to do this. Um, you know, this was certainly a step for us to, you know, get comfortable in doing this uh, and putting it out there. And I'll, I'll admit, I was the, the one that had high discomfort. We like to <laughs> not disclose anything. Uh, but this is part of the journey and, and being open and candid with, with who you are and what we're doing and, and certainly not professing to be perfect, but on the journey. And then another piece, uh, we look at sustainability, but also stewardship as well. Companies call it CSR, we call it stewardship. We're really trying to key in to those UN goals like clean water and sanitation. Um, different UN goals that our expertise can help drive. Um, and this is like sustainability. This is a, a huge motivator uh, for the engagement of our overall organization like sustainability. And when you look at what millennials are interested in going for, uh, they want to work for good companies. They want to work for companies uh, that they trust. So having great grassroots uh, work around stewardship and sustainability is critical to that. So we've got a number of aspects of our stewardship work. Um, at the highest order, we have a, a process called Innovation for Good, where we're trying to really come up with different technologies uh, different approaches to help solve some of the world's toughest problems. And access to safe drinking water, access to safe sanitation are two of those big global problems. So our, our teams have worked on them. Uh, this is one project uh, that's, that's wrapping up in, in combination with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for a closed loop sanitation system. This is being uh, tested in southern India right now. Uh, to try because there's so many issues in India uh, with sewage going right into the, the water bodies and creating incredible uh, waterborne diseases and issues in that country, and let alone the environmental issues. Um, so this was a, a technology designed to try to address that and if successful, eventually commercialize that. Another project, NGOs would come to us and say, help us make our water filters better. We did that, but then we also said, you know, we can develop a pretty good mousetrap here. So we used our uh, ceramic filtration expertise and our industrial design team and engineers to come up with our own uh, filter, the Clarity filter, which can, uh, very simple to use, uh, very high efficacy, 
Uh, so we started manufacturing this and we're selling this at a, at a very low price to NGOs uh, as well as distribution partners around the world to try to get this in the hands of, of communities and, and families out there who don't have access to safe drinking water. And then you can see some of the collaborative work with, with NGOs to, to try to drive this um, uh, around the world. This was a, a Puerto Rico response working with Operation Agua uh, to get hopefully eventually 100,000 of these uh, into Puerto Rico. And then uh, our power team recently, uh, with uh, all of the hurricane events we've had in the U.S., uh, there was a lot of work there. We sent technicians actually and, and parts shipments into Puerto Rico to, uh, to help with that. And this is our French company, STLL, uh, sending generators into the, uh, the ravaged areas of, of the Caribbean uh, during the, the recent uh, Hurricane Maria. And then just uh, a couple days ago, our, our power team uh, worked and completed their uh, work with building a house for Habitat uh, for Humanity here in Sheboygan. Um, so I, I think the, the piece on the stewardship side, to me, that's really important is that we're trying to institutionalize it as a combination of let's attack some of the world's toughest problems because I think we all want to live in a world that has hope to really address some of these tough problems, but then on the grassroots level, let's make sure that we're, we're all in all of our communities that we operate, we're all engaging in, uh, in local community activity. And then this was the, the recent wrap up of our innovation for good team. So like the water filtration and the closed loop sanitation system, we're now trying to determine of our available options of things to focus on for the next generation of real work on innovation for good, what are the projects that, uh, that we're going to select to, uh, to drive. But this whole process creates an incredible amount of enthusiasm uh, and engagement in our organization. So that's where uh, I'll finish and, uh, and open it up to, uh, to questions.